Hello everybody. This is another episode of the Silver Linings Librarian and we are in the final chapter of Bridge to Terabithia and I know I can see from my YouTube channel that there's a few people out there who have seemed to have listened to every chapter which is amazing. I'm super happy. I've enjoyed reading this. If I could I would just read books all day and hope that somewhere out there somebody finds something in it. So let's get to it. The last chapter, chapter 13, when we last left Jesse, he is pretty heartbroken, facing one of the hardest things anybody has to face, the experience of losing a friend. And it is unimaginable, but we can heal. Chapter 13, Building the Bridge. Thinking about the title and the last chapter. There's a broken rope. Can't get to bridge, to, can't get to Terabithia anymore. He woke up Saturday morning with a dull headache. It was st still early, but he got up. He wanted to do the milking. His father had done it ever since Thursday night, but he wanted to go back to it to make somehow things normal again. He shut PT in the shed and the dog's whimpering reminded him of Maybelle and made his headache worse. But he couldn't have PT yapping at Miss Bessie while he tried to milk. If you might remember, he, he Jesse struck out at his baby sister. He feels pretty bad about it, but he was in a bad, bad place. No one was awake when he bought the milk in to put it away. So he poured a warm glass for himself and got a, piece of, a couple of pieces of light bread. He wanted his paints back and he decided to go down and see if he could find them. He let PT out of the shed and gave the dog a half a piece of bread. It was a beautiful spring morning. Early wildflowers were dotting the deep green of the fields and the sky was clean and blue. The creek had fallen well below the bank and seemed less terrifying than before. A large branch was washed up onto the bank and he hauled it up to the narrowest place and laid it bank to bank. He stepped on it and it seemed firm, so he crossed on it foot over foot to the other side grabbing the smaller branches which grew out from the main one toward the opposite bank to keep his balance. There was no sign of his paints. He landed slightly upstream from Terabithia, if it was still Terabithia, if it could be entered across a branch instead of swung into. P.T. was left crying piteously on the other side. Then the dog took courage and paddled across the stream. The current carried him past Jess, but he made it safely to the bank and ran back, shaking great drops of cold water on Jess. They went into the castle stronghold. It was dark and damp, but there was no evidence there to suggest that the queen had died. He felt the need to do something fitting, but Leslie was not here to tell him what it was. The anger which obsessed him yesterday flared up again. Leslie! I'm just a dumb dodo and you know it. What am I supposed to do? The coldness inside of him had moved upward into his throat, constricting it. He swallowed several times. It occurred to them they probably had cancer of the throat. Wasn't that one of the seven deadly signs? Difficulty in swallowing. He began to sweat. He didn't want to die. Lord, he was just 10 years old. He had hardly begun to live. Leslie, were you scared? Did you know you were dying? Were you scared like me? A picture of Leslie being sucked into the cold water flashed across his brain. Come on, Prince Tarion, he said loudly. We must make a funeral wreath for the queen. He sat in the clear space between the bank and the first line of trees and bent a pine bow into a circle tying it with a piece of wet string from the castle. And because it looked cold and green, he picked spring beauties from the forest floor and wove them among the needles. He put it down in front of him. A cardinal flew down to the bank, cocked its brilliant head and seemed to stare at the wreath. P.T. let out a little growl, which sounded more like a purr. Jess put his hand on the dog to quiet him. The bird hopped about a moment more then flew leisurely away. It is a sign from the spirits, Jess said quietly. We made a worthy offering. He walked slowly, as if part of a great procession, though only the puppy could be seen, slowly forward, carrying the queen's wreath to the sacred grove. 
He forced himself deep into the dark center of the grove and kneeling, laid the wreath upon the thick carpet of golden needles. Father, into thy hands, I commend her spirit. He knew Leslie would have liked these words. They had the ring of the sacred grove in them. The solemn procession wound its way through the sacred grove homeward to the castle. Like a single bird across a storm cloud sky, a tiny piece winged its piece through the chaos inside his body. Help, Jesse, help me. A scream shattered the quietness. Jess raced to the sound of Maybelle's cry. She had gotten halfway across on the tree bridge and now stood there grabbing the upper branches, terrified to move either forward or backward. Okay, Maybelle. The words came out more steadily than he felt. Just hold still, I'll get you. He was not sure the branch would hold the weight of both of them. He looked down at the water. It was low enough for him to walk across, but still swift. Suppose it swept him off his feet. He decided for the branch. He inched out onto it until he was close enough to touch her. He'd have to get her back to the home side of the creek. Okay, he said, now back up. I can't. I'm right here, Maybelle. You think I'm gonna let you fall? Here, he held out his right hand. Hold on to me and slide sideways on the thing. She let go with her left hand for a moment and then grabbed the branch again. I'm scared, Jesse, I'm scared. Of course you're scared. Anybody be scared. You gotta trust me, okay? I'm not gonna let you fall, Maybelle, I promise you. She nodded, her eyes still wide with fear. But she let go of the branch and took his hand, straightening a little and swaying. He gripped her tightly. Okay now, it ain't far. Just slide your right foot a little way, then bring your left foot up close. I forgot which is right. The front one, he said patiently, the one closest to home. She nodded again and obediently moved her right foot a few inches. Now just let go of the branch with your other hand and hold on to me tight. She let go of the branch and squeezed his hand. Good, you're doing great. Now slide a little ways more. She swayed but did not scream. Just dug it, her little fingernails into the palm of his hand. Great, fine, you're all right. The same quiet, assuring voice of the paramedics on emergency, but his heart was bonging against his chest. Okay, a little bit more now. When her right foot came at last to the part of the branch where, which rested on the bank, she fell forward, pulling him down. Watch it, Maybelle. He was off balance, but he fell, not into the stream, but with his chest across Maybelle's legs, his own legs waving in the empty air above the water. Phew! He was laughing with relief. What you trying to do, girl? Kill me? She shook her head a solemn no. I know I swore on the Bible not to follow you, but I woke up this morning and you was gone. I had to do some things. She was scraping at the mud on her bare legs. I just wanted to find you so you wouldn't be so lonesome. She hung her head. I got too scared. He pulled himself around until he was sitting beside her. They watched PT swimming across, the current carrying him too swiftly, but he not seeming to mind. He climbed out well below the crab apple and came running back to where they sat. Everybody gets scared sometimes, Maybelle. You don't have to be ashamed. He saw a flash of Leslie's eyes as she was going into the girls' room to see Janice Avery. Everybody gets scared. PT ain't scared, and he even saw Leslie. It ain't the same for dogs. It's like the smarter you are, the more things can scare you. She looked at him in disbelief, but you weren't scared. Lord, Maybelle, I was shaking like jello. You're just saying that. He laughed. He couldn't help being glad she didn't believe him. He jumped up and pulled her to her feet. Let's go eat. He let her beat him to the house. When he walked into the basement classroom, he saw Mrs. Meyer had already had Leslie's desk taken out of the front of the room. Of course, by Monday, Jess knew. But still, but still, at the bus stop, he looked up, half expecting to see her running up across the field. Her lovely Ethan rhythmic run. Maybe she was already at school. 
Bella dropped her off as he did some days when she was late for the bus. But then when Jess came into the room, her desk was no longer there. Why were they all in such a rush to be rid of her? He put his head down on his own desk, his whole body heavy and cold. He could hear the sounds of the whispers, but not the words. Not that he wanted to hear the words. He was suddenly ashamed that he thought he might be regarded with respect by the other kids, trying to profit for himself from Leslie's death. I wanted to be the best, the fastest runner in the school, and now I am. Lord, he made himself sick. He didn't care what the others said or what they thought, just as long as they left him alone. Just as so long as he didn't have to talk to them or meet their stares, they'd all hated Leslie. So that may be Janice. Even after they'd given up trying to make Leslie miserable, they kept on despising her as though there was one of them worth the nail on Leslie's little toe. And even he himself had entertained the traitorous thought that now he would be the fastest. Mrs. Meyer barked the command to stand for the allegiance. He didn't move. Whether he couldn't or wouldn't, he didn't really care. What could she do to him, after all? Jesse Aarons? Will you step out into the hall, please? He raised his leaden body and stumbled out of the room. He th thought he heard Gary Falcher giggle, but he couldn't be sure. He leaned against the wall and waited for Monster Mouth Myers to finish singing, Oh Say Can You See and join him. He could hear her giving the class some sort of assignment in arithmetic before she came out and quietly closed the door behind her. Oh shoot, I don't care. She came over so close to him that he could smell her dime store powder. Jessie. Her voice was softer than he had ever heard it, but he didn't answer, let her yell. He was used to that. Jessie, she repeated, I just want to give you my sincere sympathy. The words were like a Hallmark card, but the tone was new to him. He looked up into her face despite himself. Behind her turned up glasses, Mrs. Myers' narrow eye were full of tears. For a minute, he thought he might cry himself. He and Mrs. Myers standing in the basement hallway, crying over Leslie Burke. It was so weird, he almost laughed instead. When my husband died, Jess could hardly imagine Mrs. Meyer ever having had a husband. People keep telling me not to cry, kept trying to make me forget. Mrs. Meyer, loving, mourning. How could you picture it? But I didn't want to forget. She took her handkerchief from her sleeve and blew her nose. Excuse me, she said. This morning when I came in, someone had already taken out her desk. She stopped and blew her nose again. It, it, we, I never had such a student in all my years of teaching. I shall always be grateful. He wanted to comfort her. He wanted to unsay all the things he had said about her, even unsay the things Leslie had said. Lord, don't let her ever find so I realize if it's hard for me, how much harder it must be for you. Let's try to help each other, shall we? Yes, um, he couldn't think of anything else to say. Maybe someday when he was grown, he would write her a letter and tell her that Leslie Burkett thought she was a great teacher or something. Leslie wouldn't mind. Sometimes like the Barbie doll, you need to give people something that's for them, not just something that makes you feel good giving it. Because Mrs. Myers had helped him already by understanding that he would never forget Leslie. He thought about it all day, how before Leslie came, he had been a nothing. A stupid, weird little kid who drew funny pictures and chased around a cow field trying to act big trying to hide a whole mob of foolish little fears running riot inside his gut. It was Leslie who had taken him from the cow pasture into Terabithia and turned him into a king. He thought that was it. Wasn't the king the best you could be? Now it occurred to him that perhaps Terabithia was like a castle where you came to be knighted. After you stayed for a while and grew strong, you had to move on. For Hen Leslie, even in Terabithia, tried to push back the walls of his mind and make him see beyond to the shining world. 
huge and terrible and beautiful and very fragile. Handle with care everything, even the predators. Now it was time for him to move out. She wasn't there. So he must go for both of them. It was up to him to pay back to the world in beauty and caring what Leslie had loaned him in vision and strength. As for the terrors ahead, for he did not fool himself that they were all behind him. Well, you just had to stand up to your fear and not let it squeeze you white. Right, Leslie? Right. Bill and Judy came back from Pennsylvania on Wednesday with the U-Haul truck. No one ever stayed long in the old Perkins place. We came to the country for her sake, now that she's gone. They gave Jessie all of Leslie's books and her paint set with three pads of real watercolor paper. She would want you to have them, Bill said. Jess and his dad helped them load the U-Haul and noontime his mother brought down ham sandwiches and coffee. A little scared the book Burks wouldn't want to eat her food, but needing, Jesse knew, to do something. At last the truck was filled and the Aaronses and the Burks stood around awkwardly, no one knowing no one knowing how to say goodbye. Well, Bill said, if there's anything we've left that you want, please help yourself. Could I have some of the lumber on the back porch, Jess asked? Yes, of course, anything you see. Bill hesitated, then he continued. I meant to give you PT, he said, but he looked at Jess and his eyes were those of a pleading little boy. But it can't seem to give him up. It's okay. Leslie will want you to keep him. The next day after school, Jess went down and got the lumber he needed, carrying it a couple boards at a time to the creek bank. He put the two longest pieces across at the narrow place upstream from the crab apple tree, and when he was sure they were firm and even, as he could make them, he began to nail on the cross pieces. What you doing, Jess? Maybelle had followed him down again as he had guessed she might. It's a secret, Maybelle. Tell me. When I finish, okay? I swear on the Bible I won't tell nobody. Not Billie Jean, nor Joyce Sand, not Mama. She was jerking her head back and forth in solemn emphasis. Oh, I don't know about Joyce Ann. You might want to tell Joyce Ann sometime. Tell Joyce Ann something that's a secret between you and me? The idea seemed to horrify her. Yeah, I was just thinking about it. Her face sagged. Joyce Ann ain't nothing but a baby. Well, she wouldn't likely be a queen first off. You have to train her and stuff. Queen? Who gets to be queen? I'll explain it when I finish, okay? And when he finished, he put flowers in her hair and led her across the bridge. The great bridge to Terabithia, which might look to someone with no magic in him like a few planks across the nearly dry gully. Shh, he said, look, where? Can't you see him, he whispered. All the Terabithians standing on tiptoe to see you. Me? Shh, yes. There's a rumor going around that the beautiful girl arriving today might be the queen they've been waiting for. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay at home.